Joyce Meyer Ministries dankt haar donateurs die deze uitzending mogelijk maakten. See, we can always expect a reward from God. And we should expect a reward from God because I think expectation is a huge part of us receiving. I frankly think that there's a lot of people that don't expect enough. Well, welcome to the program today. We are so glad that you've joined us. And today we're going to study through the sixth chapter of Matthew. You know, I've been encouraging people for quite a while now to not just read the Word, but to study the Word. And uh, just basically trying to go verse by verse through some of these chapters and just show you how easy it is really to let God show you things out of the Word. And so first of all, we pray in Jesus' name that through the Holy Spirit, we would be taught today. Because I know that I'm a teacher, but he's the teacher. So we trust him for an anointing on this, and that we'll all be helped. Matthew chapter 6 has got so many rich lessons in it, and so here we go. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 1. Take care not to do your good deeds publicly or before men in order to be seen by them. Otherwise, you'll have no reward reserved for and awaiting you with and from your Father who is in heaven. So we're going to see in Matthew chapter 6 that it talks a fair amount about motives. And I've learned over the years that why we do something is much more important to God than what we do. I think as human beings, we get all caught up in what we do. Well, look what I did, look what I did, look what I did. And we have to be very careful that even the good things that we do are not done to impress someone or you can even take the example of, of giving. You know, if we're giving to someone really with a secret aim and motive to get something back from them, then it's really not true giving. The only way giving is real giving is if we're doing it strictly to honor God in obedience or for the other person. And God knows more about our motives than we do. Motives are something that are very... Uh, difficult sometimes to get in touch with because, to be honest, it's sometimes difficult to be that honest with yourself, to say, well, you know, I, I did this, but uh, I really wanted people to notice me and, and applaud, or, you know, I did this, but there was a secret motive there of wanting to get something back. You know, I could do nice things for the most popular person at church because I want to make sure that I get invited to all the parties they give. And that's not, that's not true giving. And to me, these are very, very important lessons. And so I want us all to take this today as being important. And perhaps if we would just slow down enough in our life to stop occasionally and say, okay, now this is what I'm doing, but why am I doing it? I think then we become more wholehearted before God and we find then that we don't lose our reward. I wonder how many so-called good works we do that we never really see the reward because we haven't stopped long enough to say, am I doing this for the right reason? And so I want to make a, a point here that it says, it doesn't really say it's wrong to do good deeds publicly. It doesn't really say it's wrong even if someone sees you. It just says, don't do them in order to be seen by them. Sometimes it's almost impossible for someone not to know that you're doing something. And honestly, sometimes I think it's good for relationship for people to know that you're the one that's doing something for them. It, when we give to one another, it, it bonds us together. So I don't want people to misunderstand or take it too far and think that every time they do something, it's gotta be a big secret, although there are times when that's good. I think sometimes it's just good training. I take it as like good training to me to just see, can I do this and let God have all the credit? <laughs> you know how hard it is even when you pray for somebody and somebody comes back and they tell you this great thing that God did for them, how difficult it is not to say, oh yes, I've been praying for that. <laughs> and you know, that maybe is not always bad, but it always gets back to the motives. So that's kind of the direction we're headed here in the first part of Matthew 6. Thus, whenever you give to the poor, and I want you to notice there are several things we're going to talk about here, like when you pray, when you fast, when you give to the poor. And it never says if you do it. 
the assumption is there that we are to be doing those things. So when we give to the poor, do not blow a trumpet before you as the hypocrites in the synagogues and in the streets like to do. A hypocrite is officially a pretender, somebody who pretends to do something that they're really just doing for wrong reasons. They're doing it to show off. And if you ever want to find a group of people that Jesus kind of aggressively had some things to say about, it was the hypocrites and the Pharisees. And he said, you're like whitewashed tombs full of dead men's bones. In other words, everything looks good on the outside, but inside you're still a mess. And we know that God is a God of hearts. So don't blow a trumpet before you as the hypocrites in the synagogues and the streets like to do, that they might be recognized and honored and praised by men. Truly I tell you that they have their reward in full already. When you give to charity, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. So that basically means that even for me, like if I, let's just say that I remember going on a, a trip to India where we just had just such amazing ministry, unbelievable crowds. It was just like, oh, you know, it was just phenomenal. And I try to practice when I get back home, not sitting in the mornings and just wallowing in my, oh, my God. Oh, that was so good. And wow, nobody's ever done this before. No, no, no. To me, that's what it means not to let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. In other words, I don't, when I do something and I know that God was working through me, then when it's done, it's done. And I need to go on to the next thing he has for me. You know, not that you can't be pleased that you had a success. Everything has to be looked at in balance. But we don't need to sit around and think about how good we are good. or how, uh, how amazed people were at our performance. I think we need to just... God, that was you working through me. I give, give you the credit, and I don't need to sit around and think about how good I am. And um, verse 4, So do it that your deeds of charity might be in secret, and your Father who sees in secret, and I love this, will reward you openly. See, we can always expect a reward from God, and we should expect a reward from God, because I think expectation is a huge part of us receiving, I frankly think that there's a lot of people that don't expect enough. I think we kind of have this vague attitude of, well, we'll just see what God does. But, you know, the word to wait on God actually means to expect, to look, and to long for God. So I've kind of formed a habit of saying on a regular basis, God, I'm expecting you to do something awesome in my life today. I'm expecting to hear from you. I'm expecting to be a blessing everywhere that I go. I don't think our expectations should just all be about what we get. You know, a lot of it should be about what we can do for other people also. Now, I'm going to tell you a little story about me, and maybe you've heard it before, but it just fits into this situation so good that I, I need to tell it. Now, thankfully, I can say this has been about 30 years ago, and I'm glad I can say that <laughs> because I'd hate to tell you it was yesterday. So, <laughs> But when I was learning these things, and I, I felt like that I had a good lesson from God about this, just like I'm giving you. So... Bottom line is, is you can expect to be tested. So we're talking today about doing things in secret and, and doing them just to glorify God and not, not doing them for wrong reasons to be seen. And so I'm just letting you know that probably an opportunity for you is going to come up for you to do something a little quietly or do it more loudly, and you're going to have to choose. So here's my story. I was getting my nails done, and there were um, the girl working on me and me, and then one, one lady waiting. And so I started talking with a lady that was waiting. She knew that I was a Bible teacher and had been to a couple of my sessions, I think. And so uh, she was talking about how she worked in a cancer hospital in a cancer unit and how hard it was to have these restrictions on her that she couldn't talk to anybody about, you know, believing God for healing or being comforted by God because they, they had a rule in the hospital they had to keep their religion to themselves. And so I felt like God gave me this idea. At the time, these rhinestone Jesus pins that women wore several years ago were very popular, not so much now, but they were very popular then. And they were pretty flashy and nice size. And I just kind of felt it came to my heart to just give her that pin and to just tell her, okay, they can't dictate to you what kind of jewelry you can wear. And so just put this on your uniform. And when you bend over those patients to take care of them, they'll see the name of Jesus. And I believe there's enough power in the name of Jesus that it actually will bless them and minister to them. So 
I'd been studying this thing about doing things in secret, so I'm kind of communicating with God and getting my nails done there. I'm saying like, well, you know, how, how can I do this in secret? And, you know, kind of planning out when I'm going to do it and uh, had these little thoughts about the girl doing my nails and what she might think about my goodness and so on and so forth. You know, it's amazing how you can be trying to be good and yet, you know, be having such stinky thoughts at the same time. And uh, so I'll never forget this. The girl that was doing my nails ran out of a product that she was using. Well, the supply house to get those products was right next door to her shop. And so she said, you know what, I'm going to have to run next door and get some more of these products, but I'll just be gone a few minutes. Well, I knew that I knew that God was opening the door for me to do that in secret. But do you think I did? <laughs> and here's the way I reasoned it out in my mind. Now, this is the dangers of reasoning. I thought, well, you know, it probably would really help this girl that's doing my nails if she saw my generosity because then it might be a lesson to her that she needs to be more generous. Somehow or another, I fiddled around and reasoned around and, <laughs> and thought and padiddled with it until the girl came back. And then I had no choice at the end but to just, well, here, I felt like God told me to give you this. And, of course, everybody thought I was wonderful and, you know, good. And I got yay, yay, yay. And, you know, when I left, it was like the Lord said to me, I hope you enjoyed that. That's all you're getting. <laughs> And so I wonder how many times we trade that momentary clap for what God would give us. And who knows what that would be, but it certainly would be a lot more than a hand clap. You see, here's one of the things that I want to bring across today. I really think that we need to have more of a secret relationship with God. I think in an intimate relationship with anybody, there should be secrets. There should be things that you just shouldn't be telling other people, things that should just be between you and God. And I believe that if we are willing to keep God's secrets, that he'll tell us more secrets. Amen. And so let's just really pray and really take these lessons to heart that God will really help us to be willing to wait on his reward and not try to get our reward ourselves. And then verse 5, and, and when you pray, not if you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets that they might be seen by people. Truly, I tell you, they have the reward in full already. Now, you know, you're going to see in a minute it says when you pray, go into your closet. Well, obviously, there's private times of prayer with God, and hopefully we all have a place that we like to be. Not that you can't pray in any place, but I have a place I go in the morning to get my day started right, and maybe it's your car or where you walk at lunch, I don't know, but we, we need to have a place, keeping in mind that we can pray any place. But there's also times when we pray together as groups or we are called upon to pray in public. And I'll just be honest with you and tell you that I've caught myself many times praying on the platform and being more concerned about what the people think of my prayer than if I'm really connecting with God. And so I purposed today when I started this prayer to try to ignore all of you and what you might be thinking about my prayer and really just talk to God. And I think for all of us, there is a part of us that's from the fallen nature that we just want to be well thought of. But I do think that we need to come to the point where my reputation or your reputation in heaven is much more important to you than your reputation here on earth. So when you pray, don't do it so people will think that you're great. Try to just stay connected with God when you pray. And when you pray, go into your most private room and close the door. Pray to your Father who's in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. And when you pray, not if you pray, <laughs> when you pray, do not heap up phrases, multiplying words, repeating the same ones over and over as the Gentiles do, for they think they will be heard for their much speaking. Now, boy, is this ever a good one, because I think for some reason we've got this notion that long prayers are better than short prayers. And I know there's been times in my life when God has challenged me, why don't you try this week just asking me for whatever you need in the fewest amount of words possible? <laughs> and, you know, it's hard for us to just say, well, Lord, I ask you to forgive me for my sin. I'm so sorry. And I receive it. Thank you. 
you know, we want to go on and on and on and on and on and on and on. Or, uh, it, so I think it's very interesting that to me, it's the amount of faith that's in the prayer that's much more important than the amount of words. And here again, if I get so caught up in my words and my sounding eloquent, then all of a sudden I've really sometimes even kind of forgot what I'm trying to say. So I'm going to give you a great example because the Bible does tell us to become like little children. And I'll tell you a great example that my daughter just told me last week. She has a little uh, grandchild named Jeremiah. He's my great-grandchild. Yes, I have a great-grandchild. <laughs> but it happens young these days, you know. Um, <laughs> and Jeremiah's two, and they've taught him to pray. And uh, so his mother was sick. She had hurt her back, and it was hurting so bad that she was laying in bed crying. And Jeremiah, and I try to picture this, goes up to her, lays his hand on her, says, Jesus, Mommy, ouchie, amen. And her back quit hurting. I mean, her back immediately quit hurting. And I thought, man, am I going to use that? <laughs> and as you can see, it didn't take me long. My family tells me it doesn't take you long to stick everything in a message somewhere. But isn't that phenomenal? You know, just the simplicity of childlikeness. He wasn't trying to be seen or noticed or be applauded. You know, he just wanted his mom's back to stop hurting. And so he didn't feel like he needed to go on and on and on. I mean, what was that, like five words? I don't know. Verse 8, do not be like them, the hypocrites. And I love this. For your father knows what you need before you ask him. So, you know, the question then becomes, well, if he knows what I need before I ask him, then why do I need to ask? Well, obviously because he tells us to. And it's part of relationship. Any one of my children that walk in my house, they already know that they can have anything that they want in my refrigerator. But most of the time, not all the time, <laughs> but most of the time they'll say, can I have some of this turkey? Can I have a piece of this cake? Can, you know, can I have it? And that's just, it's just relationship to ask and receive. Even though God knows what we need we still want to go to him, and I'm always very fond of James 4, 2, you have not because you ask not. That's just been like one of my favorite lifetime scriptures that so many times we frustrate ourselves trying to make something happen, and all we really need to do is just go and, and ask God for it. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. Now, we come upon what we call the Lord's Prayer, which, to be honest, the disciples are asking Jesus to teach them to pray. And... So this is Jesus teaching people how to pray. And if you look at this, I mean, it probably takes less than a minute. <laughs> but here again, it has to be sincere. And of course, when you pray the same prayer over and over, like we have done for years with the Lord's Prayer, it is pretty easy to just get into reciting and not paying any attention. And there have been people that have taught, and I think it's a good teaching, that you can take each one of these points in the Lord's Prayer and you can expand them. You can talk to the Lord about them as long as you want to, but there's nothing here saying that you have to. So it simply goes like this. Our Father who's in heaven, we start out with worship. Holy is your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I want your will, God. Whatever your will is in the earth today, let that be done in the nations, let that be done in my life, let that be done in our ministry. There's a little expansion of it. Give us this day our daily bread. Wow, what a, what a way to get all your daily needs met. <laughs> Give us this day our daily bread. You know, there's no demanding spirit here. Uh, you know, I hate that demanding thing that we get into sometimes. Now, Lord, if, you, if I don't get a breakthrough in a week, I just don't know if I can hold on. <laughs> we, we don't, you know, we're not going to demand from God or, or threaten God that we're going to walk away if he doesn't give us what we want. We need to be pleased with everything we get and trust him. Forgive us our debts. I, I love this. As we also have forgiven, left, remitted, and let go of the debts and have given up resentment against our debtors. I wonder what would happen if every time before we ever ask God to forgive our sins, if we would just simply say to ourselves, now am I mad at anybody about anything? <laughs> Got to be quiet for a minute and let you think. <laughs> am I mad at anybody about anything? Because if we believe what this scripture says, it basically goes on to say that if we don't forgive other people, that God won't forgive us. 
And of course, I'm not doing a whole teaching today on forgiveness, but to be honest, it's one of the most important teachings in the Word of God. It is unbelievable how many people that are Christians are angry at someone. I mean, really astounding. And we have to understand that we are living in times when Satan is doing his absolute best to keep people angry and offended. And we must be smart enough to resist him, not assist him. Amen. If you forgive people, verse 14, their trespasses, their reckless and willful sins, leaving them, letting them go, and giving up resentment, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you don't forgive others, their trespasses, their reckless and willful sins, he's not even saying that they hurt you accidentally. He's saying they did it on purpose. They're willful sins. <laughs> then we still need to forgive them. Leaving them, let him go, and giving up resentment, but neither will your Father forgive you. And when you're fasting, not if you fast, when you fast, do not look gloomy and sour and dreary like the hypocrites, for they put a dismal countenance on their face, that their fasting may be apparent to and be seen by all men. Truly, I tell you, they already have their reward in heaven. Now, I certainly don't have time here to do a big, long teaching on fasting, and I'm well aware that some of you probably don't even, aren't even familiar with that term. I know I was a Christian for many years before I was. All the great people we read out about in the Bible fasted. Jesus fasted. Paul fasted. Esther fasted. Uh, just over and over and over, Daniel fasted. And like I said, I'm not here to give a big discourse on fasting, but it's a time to show God your sincerity. It's a time to separate yourself from eating for a period of time just to give yourself more to prayer. And some fasts are long. Some could just be a few hours. I noticed in the book of Acts where the disciples said that they had fasted and prayed and then God showed them that they were to separate Paul and Barnabas unto them and send them out into their ministry. Well, I don't think they'd been fasting for weeks and days. For all I know, they got together that morning and they just hadn't eaten yet and it was noon. And so sometimes it's a short period of time. Sometimes people fast certain things. Daniel ate no pleasant food for 21 days. So perhaps he didn't eat any bread or any sweets. I know one man that every year in the month of January, he just doesn't eat any kind of bread or sweets for 30 days. There have been a couple of times when I've fasted television for 30 days at a time just to not let something get a hold on me. Another purpose for fasting is just to say, you know, I don't need to drink three soda pop every day, and so I'm not going to drink any for 30 days just because I don't think it would be godly for me to let this thing get a hold on me. So, uh, and I think that sometimes, this is just my opinion, I fasted a lot more in the early days of my ministry than I do now, and I've kind of come to the point now where I, my goal is to live more of a fasted life. I mean, there's some people who feel just for a spiritual discipline, they should fast one day every week, and they do that. So I'm not here to give you lessons about it. I'm just to say that it's something that we should pray about and consider. And whenever we do it, in whatever way we do it, we don't need to announce it or to go around, I'm starving. I'm starving. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I feel like I'm going to faint and pass out. And um, so all of these things really refer to motives. Let's look at verse 17. But whenever you fast, perfume your head and wash your face. Look happy. Don't look hungry so that your fasting may not be noticed by men. Now, it's impossible to fast for very long and the people that are close around you not know that you're doing it because you get curious after a while about why you're never eating. And uh, so it's here again. It's not that you can't tell anybody, but we need to have a purpose for telling people, not just to make a display out of it. So then he goes on verse 19. He says, Do not gather and heap up and store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust and worm consume and destroy and where thieves break through and steal. But gather and heap up and store for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust nor worm consume and destroy and where thieves do not break through and steal. So I think that, that the long and the short of that message is to let's don't live for earthly things and for earthly applause and for our earthly reputation and to be well thought of by men and to be seen and noticed and to be promoted because if, that, if that's where our treasure is, if that's what we think about all the time, that's where our heart is. That's wherever your treasure is, that's where your heart's going to be. What you put yourself into. You know, my heart's with Joyce Meyer Ministries because I have put so much of my life into this. So there's a good possibility it means more to me than anybody else in the building. <laughs> well, see, when you, when you really, what you put yourself into, that's what really means a lot to you. And so he says we need to be making the decisions that we make 
with, with more of a, a heart of eternity in mind and the fact that we're eternal beings that are going to live forever someplace and we want to be in the right place. And I think a lot of our reward we will get here, but I'm more than what we're going to get here, we're going to get in heaven. And so I hope that you enjoyed this teaching today on Matthew chapter 6 and, and uh, thank all of you for being with us. Today, we are having a medical camp on behalf of Joyce Mayer Ministries. It's a big event for the village people so that they can receive medication and the love of Christ. That's what is happening here right now. There are so many instances where people who have come here, they have been suffering from those diseases or infections from quite a long, but they never go to a medical help because they don't have a finance even for travel. People are quite receptive to us because they are seeing that we are helping them beyond just sharing the gospel. And you know. this event has been uh, being planned in our minds and hearts for the past two, three months. So the church in Hyderabad is praying, and the village church has been praying continuously. And that's what we are seeing that God's grace, everything is going on smoothly. <laughs> Thank you very much for your contribution to India, and because of your help. Yo, we are you making us to go every corner, looking every place. And without your support, we cannot go. Met deze mobiele kliniek geven we bij Hand of Hope elke maand nieuwe hoop aan duizenden mensen. Hier krijgen de patiënten alles op één plek: van oogtesten tot röntgenfoto's, tot het verstrekken van medicatie. En dat allemaal dankzij de vele donateurs die dit werk steunen. So I'm inviting you to join us in partnership. Help us glorify God and share Christ. Help us help hurting people. Help us feed the poor and get the gospel to people that don't yet know what we know. You can check us out on JoyceMeyer.org and find out all that you need to know about partnership or you can call the ministry. God bless you and thank you for praying about this. Elk gebed en elke donatie telt. Samen veranderen we de wereld. De dag begint pas goed met een goed ontbijt. En een dagelijkse overdenking van Joyce. Nieuwe impulsen en bemoedigende gedachten die je zullen sterken tijdens je dag. Abonneer je gratis op de overdenkingen op joyce-meyer.nl overdenking of op Facebook. Begin je dag goed, het is het waard.